Hi, everyone. How good is it to be back together at DLD? Already um, bumping into old friends, meeting new friends, having great conversations. It's what I love about this conference. Um, when, when I started with this topic, thankfully, both of my panelists agreed. We're, we're going to throw out the notion that, first of all, Germany is not going to be the next Silicon Valley. No one's going to be the next Silicon Valley. There's an old uh, Jewish story that when Rabbi Zusia gets to heaven, he, sa he tells his, his congregation, God's not going to ask me, why weren't you more like Moses? Why weren't you more like Joseph? He's going to say, why weren't you more like Zusia? The idea is that everyone needs to be their best self, not somebody else. And I think that really applies here. So uh, we want Germany to be more like Germany. Um, where are we? I mean, because it, it really has been a while since we've convened. We're post a pandemic. Where is the German tech ecosystem today? Do some level setting. You know, is it exactly the same as it was going into the pandemic? What has shifted? So first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see everybody in person again. Um, I think that years ago, it was absolutely OK that we were looking for role models on how startup ecosystems should work and what makes them strong and successful. However, over the last years, as you say, things have changed quite a bit. And I am a strong believer that we have nothing to, we, we don't have to hide here. I think that Germany and Europe as a whole has a lot of really great assets and the big opportunity ahead of us to become our own version of a globally leading ecosystem. And to be honest, I think that we are already there. European venture capital has become a very serious asset class. And if you compare the venture capital returns here with the venture capital returns in the US, I think in the last 10 years, Six out of 10 vintages from European VCs have outperformed the US peers. So to talk a little bit about Germany and some numbers maybe to share. Today, already 400,000 people plus work directly into, in startups and 1.3 million indirectly. With the current growth rates that you can see on the job market, it's 10 years, maybe 15 years, until the startup scene will be the biggest employer in Germany, bigger than the car manufacturers, bigger than the construction companies, and bigger than the chemistry industries. So if you ask me what is the current situation, I'll tell you it's very clear that we will see more and more great companies coming from all parts of the world, coming from all parts of Europe, coming from all parts of Germany, be it Munich, be it Berlin, be it Stuttgart, it doesn't matter, be it Neumünster, you said earlier that you've seen the, the city. Um, and these jobs will be created here for people in 20, 30, 40 years from now to have a job because many of the core industries that we have right now are under severe attack by the same products that we invest in. So um, in my opinion, this, this only knows one direction and I'm more bullish than ever also in the next decade here in Europe. So, Christian, super bullish. It sounds like you have almost everything you need. Um, Jeanette, what, what are the missing ingredients? What are the things um, that you would love to have that are not as strong? Well, let me maybe also just emphasize a few things that actually work really well. I think looking at the trajectory the German ecosystem has taken since six years now, and I think six years was really the kind of turning point where Germany started doubling down on their strength. Um, before that, we were just trying to replicate what had worked in other markets, right? Especially in the consumer space, we're like, oh my God, these things are happening in China and in the US, and let's try to replicate that for Europe. And I think it was probably a very healthy starting point because it laid a foundation, especially with Rocket Internet at the time, that really kind of just created an initial spark and just kind of gave the notion of what could be possible. I think in 2016, we really started doubling down on B2B infrastructure to, cover, to you know, power a lot of these new consumption behaviors that were driven by a lot of these consumer applications people were using. Not all of them were European, but people were certainly shifting and changing their, their behaviors, right? And looking at the core strengths, especially of Germany, but of broader Europe, we've built a lot of the world market leaders. 
in a lot of these verticals, right? Like BASF is German, it's the leading process industry company in the world. Same with a lot of the OEMs and the list goes on and on. And then if you look at the stuff that is actually needed to do what we do today, which is logistics, which has a lot to do with supply chain, as we all learn the hard way these days, it really, I think, appears to not only us as German-based investors, but especially to a lot of the Americans to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's actually stuff happening here that is very interesting. Um, but it actually took, and now we're getting to the, the bad element and, you know, it took a lot of the U.S. funds and the tier ones like Sequoia, you know, that all came over to Europe over the last one and a half years. And that is actually definitely something that changed with COVID because that wasn't the case pre-COVID. They woken up to the thing that, wait a minute, Europe has something to offer that is actually very interesting from a risk return perspective. Um, and then it took kind of a while for LPs to understand, wait a minute. I'm investing into an American fund in US dollars, and they're investing my money back into Germany. What's happening, right? So I think there's still a lot of that notion. Just spoke to a large um, you know, fund of fund yesterday. The largest, the two single largest LPs are German. I've never even heard of them because they don't actually invest into German funds. <laughs> they go into American funds that then invest into Germany. So I think that still needs to change from a capital allocation perspective. I think the efficiency that has basically um, incurred from like VC to founder relationship ha has become so much better. You know, it used to be in Germany at least a VC dominated ecosystem where the VCs would be able to call the shots. Now, thank God, it's the founders that can actually set the terms that they want to see. So it's gotten a lot more equilibrated and a healthy degree of competition, which is great. Um, but that whole LP side, I think, needs solving because um, we also need to make sure that we are the ones that actually capitalize on the winners um, that we're producing here. So that's maybe the good and the bad. Yeah. Maybe just one interesting point to, to add here because I think that Jeanette has made a great example of these market leaders coming from Germany and, and Europe. And interestingly enough, we are at like probably day one or day two in the new generation of market leaders happening. But just look at companies like Klarna, uh, UiPath, Silonis here from Munich. These companies are category defining market leading businesses through the entire world. So what BASF and Volkswagen and, and other big German corporations have been in the last century, it's happening in front of our eyes just right now while we speak. Yeah, and the issue is, I think the Germans have trouble seeing that. They always praise you know, the US guys when they come over here and think they're great. And I remember back in 2016, um, and Christian actually played a big role in, in helping us La Familia at the time. And we were ideating and thinking what is actually needed in order to help these new blossoming B2B companies um, get, get onto the step onto the scene, right? And we were like very cautious in our assumption of how big they can get. At the time, the largest company ever coming out of Europe was Skype, and they were valued at 8 billion. Now we have a Klarna that's valued at 45 billion, and the list goes on and on and on of, of companies that are, you know, blossoming out of, out of Europe. We have Personio, which we have on stage right after this, which is a um, portfolio company of ours we're super, um, super, in, in, you know, enthused by, and they are now valued at over 6 billion, right? So I think there are all these momentum um, things happening here, and actually a lot of people, and that's an interesting point, when I go to the US, they're like, oh my god, you know, I heard about Hanno, the founder of Personio, and apparently his management style is insane. We had never seen anything like it. And I'm like, well, maybe it's also because he, you hadn't seen anything like it. He's German, and he's doing things probably very different to what, the way you guys are doing things. And so they are actually looking to us and are taking quite a few examples um, for what they think is great leadership. Um, so I think we can also be a little bit proud of what's happening here, especially in Munich. So we've talked about just some of the good startup energy and ecosystem and things that have emerged. I also want to look at the structural differences between the US and Europe. And I think that it's instructive. Again, I think one of the reasons that, you know, building the, the Me Too's and the Europe version of whatever wasn't by itself a good strategy. I, I agree with your point. It was a starting point. And I think there's occasionally opportunities where the market is more different than similar. I think there can be opportunities for those kinds of companies. But where I see the opportunity, when I come here, you know, it's, you know, Germany knows how to build really complicated industrial things that the rest of the world doesn't. The, like harnessing, you know, we always talk, you know, every country has its natural resources, and that's how we've thought about it for a long time. But I think there, countries also have their knowledge resources. And, and how important is it for Germany to build on those knowledge resources, the experience, the talent, the muscle memory of doing those kinds of things where it might have a leg up 
and, and I think this can be instructive to other regions as well, versus trying to compete at things where maybe it's harder. You know, there's certain things that are certainly going to be harder doing in Europe, um, doing in Germany, doing in Europe. Um, but there's things that growing up in Europe can help with. Are there examples that you've seen of that? Is there enough of that happening? I think there are actually many examples. Um, and I alluded to this earlier. If you look at these really large, complex industries, process manufacturing is no joke, right? If you deal with the FDA, you better know what you're up to. Same with logistics and supply chain. We all realize only now, when our goods aren't arriving on the scheduled delivery date, how incredibly complex and fragile this whole system has become. It takes a lot of process understanding to actually know how to build products that actually are, you know, really feel intuitive to the users that use them, that users feel like they can trust these products. And this is specifically something where I think we have a unique touch because we have built these, you know, world market leaders. And these world market leaders have then gone on and funded faculties within large universities. And they actually went and, you know, educated people within their own rows that then go out, identify a problem, and start a company. So this is a very different ecosystem structure to what you see in the US, right? Where most of the people, you know, go to Stanford, go to, you know, work at a tech company, and then basically start a, start a business, right? They have a more, they have, their frame of mind is, I think, essentially more coined and, and driven by, by, by these variables. And I think that's actually very, very valuable and something to be proud of. And to your point, Christian, I think this is definitely something where we are going to build very, very large companies. Um, and looking at the potential we have, I think our ambition back in 2016 was to say, let's build companies. If we take 10 largest companies globally, at least two or three have to be European. And we have to make that happen within 10 years. And looking at what's happening in China right now, we are well underway to make that, to make that happen and make that a reality. And Kristen, kind of to that point, like, and since you brought up China, I'm going to weave China into this question. I mean, China didn't accidentally get these things. They are pouring just a ton of investment. It's a national priority. And they're just funneling all this investment. I don't think Germany is looking to create as closed an ecosystem as I think China ultimately wants. But talk about the environment. And when I look at um, German government and, and German sensibilities, a really strong belief around data privacy and a different attitude, which, again, if you're going to create a data-gobbling consumer giant, probably not going to happen here. But there might be other businesses where a privacy-centric X um, that really gets and believes in the European system, not just complies with GDPR, but actually fundamentally believes in data privacy. Um, are there opportunities there? Because it seems to me like most of that history has been sort of competing with one hand tied behind your back. Absolutely. I mean, before I get to this question, just like one, one more comment on what you've asked before. I think that because Europe is so fragmented with different jurisdictions and different languages and sometimes even different currencies, a founder who starts a company here must have an international mindset from day zero. So right. that is a big strength. And if you just look at the European market as a whole, it's 500 million people living here. So that's massive and gigantic already. And now to get to your next question, and I think it will all boil down to one very simple thing, which I believe is going to form and shape most of the startup ecosystems around the world when we are speaking about China, and that is how is the free world, the democratic world, going to think about building longevity and sustainable companies, and how is an authoritarian state uh, where the government decides this today and this tomorrow, um, how is this going to affect? Um, their longevity and, and, and sustainable and, and um, um, innovative mindset and, and future. And this brings me to one of the things that we need here and where we will compete against the entire world, and that's talent. Europe is an amazing place for people who believe in the free world. Many of the human rights that we have subscribed here are not human rights in other parts of the world. So I think that there is a large amount of people everywhere in the world who would love to live here and to work here. And we need these people. And talent was actually going to be my next question, because usually when you're talking about what are the ingredients when we start with that silly next Silicon Valley conversation, it's, it's about 
capital, it's about talent. But that conversation has really shifted during the pandemic. Um, and I'm curious how it is here. I haven't, this is my first time back in Europe since the pandemic. In the United States, certainly, there has been a huge shift from people need to be in the Bay Area, we pay to relocate people, you know, maybe we open a remote office because there's talent in this city, to we just want the best people wherever they are. Um, when that, you take that a step further and it's on the global scale, that's an opportunity because if you need a specific set of skills that you don't really see around you, you can hire them wherever they are, but it also means your talent is being attractive to people remotely. How does remote work and the, the real normalization of virtual work uh, change the equation when it comes to talent? And is Europe a net beneficiary from that? Yeah, I would definitely say so. And I think we actually invested in a company called Deal, which recently announced it's, it's Deal, D-E-A-L? D-E-L, D-E-E-L, okay. which is a global payroll solution that recently announced, you know, the fastest growth ever to get to 100 million in AR and like a 12 billion valuation. So this company has just skyrocketed off the ground, right? We were the largest institutional check at the seed. And th I think the reason we probably saw that problem was because we were European and we knew that we needed to you know, hire people remotely in order to make sure we could get our companies staffed with talent. Right? I think we kind of felt the pain looking at all our portfolio companies very much. And I think right now, looking at talent mobility, a lot of other European countries are now heading the way. Like France is, 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 has laid out their own program, so did, so did Portugal and Finland. And I think that's something where we, for all the politicians that are hopefully listening right now, where we need to step up our game and get going, because otherwise we're going to have a big issue. And I think looking at Berlin and what made Berlin specifically so attractive to people, you know, in the, the early innings of the tech ecosystem there is that it had a lot of structural analogies to, you know, Renaissance Italy. It was a lot of creatives in the room. There was a lot of, it was almost like a city in puberty, you know, where so, much, so many things were happening and there was just such a multicultural sense of, 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 of possibility. And it's, it's, it's similar sort of sense of possibility that we're seeing in, in Silicon Valley, right? People go to Silicon Valley believing that they can become anything and they're being entrusted with, with their abilities, right? And I think Berlin had a similar vibe to it, which is what initially attracted people. So we shouldn't be scared to invite more different cultures to come to Germany, spend time here, enrich us with their presence, and, you know, do the jobs that we don't have enough hands of doing. Because looking at the, looking at the, um, you know, at the, at the typical sort of trajectory of GDP growth, we've never in the history of time seen GDP growth without population growth. And right now, our population is stagnating, so we better, well, A, get automation going, which we are working on <laughs> amongst all our founders, and secondly, make sure that the, we just get more talent in as much as we can. And yeah, so politicians, please get to it. Christian, what are you seeing? Because I'm curious on this question. I mean, again, just because the borders uh, sort of become less relevant to whether you can hire talent or not doesn't mean you're a net beneficiary. You could be a net you know, outflow of talent. What are you seeing in terms of how has remote work changed German startup ecosystem? Yeah, so, so first of all, I mean, what Jeanette has just said is like absolutely correct. I mean, this will be, in my opinion, the biggest, the single biggest driver of the success of the European startup ecosystem if we can compete globally around the best people. So now you have to differentiate between two dimensions. There's the one dimension, which is the entrepreneur. Maybe the entrepreneur is okay to have a developer who's based in India or Costa Rica or wherever. But then there's the government. The government needs people within our borders to pay taxes here. I mean, this is important because otherwise there's no GDP growth. So this will be a way, and I am a stronger, strong believer in that, where uh, politicians and founders and investors can work together very closely to design a way to get the best people to Europe. And that must be our incentive to get that done, because it's not only for startups and VC firms, but that is for the big corporations, that's for the small corporations, that's for all the companies in this country, in France, and everywhere in Europe. We will need net millions of people coming here. There's no other way around it. We need to upskill people, we need to reskill people, but we also need to become an attractive place 
that creates an incentive for people who are outside of the European Union to move here and live in Europe. That is incredibly important. Otherwise, like the startup ecosystem will stall at some point. As Jeanette said, it's a very concerning number. If GDP growth and population growth suddenly like are going like out of the kind of dimensions that we would like to see. And so you know, may I say one more thing? It's not only getting is my wife working here. Yeah. And um, it's not about only about getting people into the country, but what about all the women we have here? You know, like why in the name of God do we not make it that we have a better education system, right? Like if I wasn't if I didn't have private help, which thank God I was you know, able to have at the time, I wouldn't have been able to do what I'm doing. And I have four children that are all small. So we need to give women the opportunity to work. And that doesn't work if we don't give them opportunities and options to actually either have external child care or, and that's another point I'm willing to make here, give them at least a tax deduction on hiring private helpers. Currently, you have to pay your net revenue, net income, and then basically pay the gross salary of, an, of, of, of private caretakers. So anyway, that's another like, thing I'm willing, willing to fight Which for. Which is great. And by the way, this is actually a European asset because it, as challenging as you describe it, there are actually more resources for women in, the, in Europe by far than in the United States. The problem you describe is absolutely a problem here, and it's absolutely a far worse problem in the United States. And we have so many women going to university. We have incredible talent that is just simmering there. So just let's activate that. And one of the conversations we've been having, <laughs> one of the conversations we've been having is that this hybrid workplace can be a better place for women. Uh, Reshma Sajani, who founded Girls Who Code, has been really active in this discussion. Um, it can be better for women, but it won't automatically be. Because this hybrid world, what we could soon have is men returning to the office because they had to do 10% more work at home, and they're like, whoa, if I go to the office, I don't have to do anything at home. And the women, back in the same position, trying to take care of the household and you know, do their work. And so it, it really requires the policy that you're talking about, but also a shift in how businesses um, think about it, that proximity bias, a whole bunch of issues. But to, to your point, I think it really can be an asset for Europe, particularly if it continues to move ahead of the US uh, when it comes to supporting working women. Yeah, and you know, I have the best example actually sitting in the audience, who's, which is my partner, Judith. She's actually the son of an immigrant that originally came from, a uh, son, the daughter, I'm so sorry, the daughter of an immigrant that came originally from Nigeria. And she is the biggest talent I've ever seen in my life. And I'm just so lucky to have her with me. And we do this together, we're two women. And the first fund we did together, people looked at us like, what are these girls doing, right? And right now they're turning around and said, wait a minute, this is actually working. So, you know, they, they, I think you have to set examples that creates signal strength for other people to buy in. And we actually have the most diverse team. Like we have over 50% women in our team. And that's not, that's probably because we're women, because we have a more, you know, network that relates to female founders or female, um, you know, tech enthusiasts that want to come and join us on, on, on what we're building. So I think we just need more women that actually get things done, that actually dare to try, um, and then dare to fail. That's another thing that Germany, I think, is really great at, is pointing fingers at people that fail. I think that needs to stop. We have to allow people to fail, to make mistakes. And I wouldn't call it failure. I would call it not succeeding, and then maybe succeeding at the next point, and next iteration in time. But if we manage those two things on, on talent that we have at home, I think we'll be in a great place. Awesome. Uh, so we've talked a lot about talent and applaud all that you're doing. Talent and, and ensuring that there's a good flow of talent really is critical. Um, what are the other things, Christian, on your to-do list? You have a lot of conversations in addition to your day job investing money. You also represent German uh, startups in these conversations with the government. What's on, what are you telling them? What's on your to-do list? And there's actually something you're not you're not doing that we were talking about. So I think that uh, one point that uh, Jeanette touched upon earlier is that we, we need to, and, and I think also in the light of our dependencies upon Russian oil and gas right now, I think it is even more important that we also look at the cash flows. Uh, where does the money come from that is being invested here in Europe, in Munich, in Berlin, and where is the money going once we exit a company? And I think that there is an argument to be made that we need to mobilize uh, a lot more private capital here from, from Europe to actually fill the gap 
um, that 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 we see right now because there is a there's a big dependency uh, also upon countries that I called authoritarian countries earlier. The second point is is clearly, and I want to stress that, and I can't get tired of stressing it, is talent. I mean, like we got to fix. Uh, the, the, the process of bringing people here, we call it the tech visa. We got to make sure that people can come here like in a very smooth way and we got to make sure that we have a red carpet rolled out for them and that they just want to be here in, in two weeks. Um, stock options, the next thing, like if we want to attract the best people around the world, we need to make sure that we have a competitive tech scheme also on, 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 on uh, employee stock option programs. and. Um, Today, as the talent war is global, we just have to face it. And I'm not saying let's create tax incentives for all the founders and investors. That would be totally wrong. But I want a level playing field. I want to make sure that we compete head on head on the same terms. And then we can see which country is better. And the third thing, in, in my opinion, is what you have touched upon a little bit earlier, is on uh, competition laws and be GDPR or like any other of these like the digital uh, services acts and digital market acts. Like we, we have to we have to find a way that uh, the the market forces that we also believe in here a lot are not being uh, undermined uh, by monopolistic structures that actually kill uh, the, the the free market economy. So these are things where we have to. Uh, have a have an eye on and that we have to watch and this is what I usually spend most of my uh lobbyistic work on. And you know what we need more capital on is actually making sure we get breakthrough technologies funded, because that's really something that right now is not happening. We lost on batteries, let's not lose on alternative energy forms. That's really something that I think we need to agree. step up our game. Well, this has been a great conversation and I appreciate all that you both do and bring to that conversation and it's great to be having this conversation. If you enjoyed this panel, I do a daily technology newsletter for Axios. All you have to do is go to getlogin.axios.com all we ask for is an email, fully GDPR compliant. And uh, I'd love to be in your inbox as well. And it's wonderful to be back at TLD. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Ina. Ina.